We'll go with one question, one follow-up. Please state your name and outlet uh, before asking your question. We'll start off here in the room before making our way to the phones. Uh, we'll go to the first at the mic. Hi, it's Carrie Tate from the Globe and Mail. My first question is for the Deputy Premier, Mike Ellis. Um, Premier, uh, pardon me, uh, Minister Ellis, yesterday the Premier uh, had disclosed she's gone to three hockey games um, as a guest of others, and she had said that it's up to staff and ministers to um, disclose their own information. So I'm wondering how many games you went to and who hosted you? Uh, one game hosted by the Edmonton Oilers. Okay, and for the Premier, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Minister. For the Premier yesterday, you had said that um, you aren't responsible for your staff when we had asked them, and you had basically said if we had questions for other people, such as ministers and your staff, that we should ask them. Um, we have been asking your staff repeatedly. Mm -hmm. We have been asking cabinet ministers. If you aren't responsible for the actions of your staff, who is? Well, let me tell you how the ethics rules work. So first of all, you know, I understand know, the no, ethics no, I don't rules. think you do, because first of all, uh, no government money has been spent on any of the inquiries that you're making. That's number one. Number two, what private individuals choose to do with their private money is not governed by the ethics commissioner. Number three. MLAs do have disclosure requirements. No MLAs are allowed to take private flights. Uh, any expense under 250 does not have to be reported. Expenses of 250 to 1,000 dollars do have to be reported in an annual disclosure to the ethics commissioner. And anything above 1,000 dollars has to be reported within 60 days. And so, though that, that those are the rules, and I expect every staff member and I expect every MLA to follow them. Premier, you wrote the rules. You rewrote the rules. You made them easier to accept gifts, and your staff does not have to disclose those. The staff have to disclose to the chief of staff, correct. Right, but Thank not you, Carrie. to the public. We're going to go to our next Will question Will you disclose here? to the public what gifts your Look, staff has accepted? I have arranged a meeting. I've asked for a meeting with the ethics commissioner, as has the chief of staff to me, and if there are any uh, interpretations that he needs to give me, so that there are any modifications to policy, I'm looking forward to getting his his answers but as i said i expect all staff and all mlas to follow the rules thank you carrie let's go to our next question here hi there jordan canning with ctv news a uh, question for the premier i heard minister ellis's response to this earlier mm -hmm. but when it comes to the wildfire situation yeah. and the emergency alert that was sent out yesterday there was some incorrect messaging sent out initially saying that the wildfire was arriving at the town site within five hours later corrected to people should be evacuated within five hours what kind of oversight does the province have on those messages when communication is critical? And what do you say to those people who may have seen that message and been frightened or stressed? Well, I saw the message and I was frightened and stressed, as uh, Minister Ellis will attest to, and my chief of staff and my deputy minister and anyone I could reach at 11 o'clock at night to find out what was going on. I didn't want to go to sleep worried that Jasper might be hitting fire at four o'clock in the morning. And so it took a lot of work to realize that what they intended was to say that it took five hours to evacuate. Um, we did some modeling and shared some information with them and it's close, like make no mistake, there is certainly a fire threat on both uh, sides of the of the city. Um, but if, and if worst case scenario happens, they'll be in, in real trouble in a few days, but we're gonna tr do whatever we can to make sure that that doesn't happen. Uh, we've put an active reach out to Parks Canada. Remember, this is a federal park, so it's federal jurisdiction, so we have to wait for them to invite us in. And we have put our hand out and said, we are happy to be here. We've staged equipment to Henton. We told them that we were prepared to help in whichever way they need us to, and they're taking us up on that offer. And same with the uh, the Jasper Mayor. We've done a reach out with, to him as well to see what uh, what we can do to, to be able to support. But I have had a conversation with Minister Ellis on this, and it's it's a, you know, it's a new process to allow municipalities to directly access the um, emergency alert. I think this is the first time that uh, Jasper has done so. And so we, we may need to just have an additional step just to make sure that when information is going out, it's communicated accurately so that it doesn't cause that, that kind of panic. I mean, nobody wants to be um, in a state of panic at 11 o'clock at night not knowing where they're going to go. So there's there clearly is some more work we need to do to get the information out accurately. But that being said, there's still a, a major fire risk, not only in Jasper, but in multiple 
other uh, areas in northern Alberta, including around many uh, oil sand sites. My um, minister, uh, Todd Lowen, has been overseeing the firefight since the beginning of Ju July is when it really began to get bad again. We're calling in international resources, and it really is still all hands on deck until we can get those fires doused. But um, I'm very pleased that uh, the communication lines are open and everybody is working together on this. Another uh, question from a colleague, if I may. Yep. What do you believe will be the impact to our energy sector under another potential Donald Trump presidency, and how would that impact differ under Kamala Harris? Well, well look, we, we have a, a great relationship with America, regardless of, of who is in the White House. And that's demonstrated in the fact that uh, last year, I think we ended up with a record amount of cross-border trade valued at $185 billion. So I would fully anticipate that that would continue. I think our uh, conversations with our, our Democrat um, uh, partners would be along the lines of building out natural gas and hydrogen, carbon capture utilization and storage, ammonia, uh, uh, geothermal, small modular nuclear, all of those green energy solutions. And I think we have an opportunity to expand into their markets on that basis. I think our, our conversations with the Republicans would be more along the lines of can we build more pipelines? Can we restart the Keystone XL uh, pipeline? Can we look at other ways to be able to expand existing capacity? So there'll be different conversations conversations, but I still think no matter who is in the White House, it'll be a very constructive, positive relationship. I would say, for instance, the Americans, um, even though the, the, the Michigan governor had been uh, pressing to shut down Line 5, which would be devastating not only for Michigan, but also for uh, Quebec and Ontario, the, uh, the, 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 the U.S. government did put in an amicus brief saying that they supported the interpretation of the 1977 pipeline treaty, that, uh, that the, this pipeline, it was essential infrastructure and shouldn't be shut down. So that's under a Democrat presidency. So I, I think that there's a practicality there, and we certainly want to work with whoever is willing to, to work with us. Thank you. I think we have one more at the mic here. Go ahead. Yeah, Chris Brown, Cross Border Network. Um, this money, it's new. Where is uh -huh. exactly coming from? And in your announcement today, it seems you're focusing on the metro areas around Edmonton and Calgary. What about rural? Rural schools are underfunded right now. You go tour some rural schools, they're in disrepair and they need some updates doesn't seem like there's a lot of money going to rural schools in this new funding announcement. Look, I'll, I'm sure the minister will want to talk about this too, but uh, one thing, and I, you know, I appreciate the advocacy of uh, the ASBA on this, is that we, I think we were all surprised by the number of people who chose to make Alberta their home in 2023. We'd been having multiple quarters of net out migration, and I think our funding model reflected that. We wanted to stabilize declining enrollment boards. I don't know that we anticipated that we would see 200,000 people choose to call Alberta their home in 2023 and for that to continue. And the good news is there's a lot of young families that are coming, so that's the, the positive side of things. But it also means extra pressure on the schools, and they've been very clear about some of the, the pressures that, that, that uh, they're facing. So this is just an immediate um, way of addressing some of the pressure that we know is coming on rolling out more modulars as well as uh, providing the additional per student funding so that school boards can choose how they want to staff up. Uh, so it is new money. It's coming from, um, I mean, technically it's uh, the way I, it's coming from last year's surplus is, is how I look at it. I think you'll see with our government that rather than spend surpluses before they're realized, we want to realize surpluses and then have a constructive conversation about how to spend them. So that is how I had the conversation with my finance minister. The, uh, but there's more to come. We, we know from what we have heard and from what we've seen from the capital plan submissions, that there is a significant amount of new school spaces that need to be built. We we, we will fund every single student, but the, the it'll be a much more comfortable learning environment if they can be um, if they if we can build the schools fast so that we're able to fund them in appropriate spaces. So the minister is is currently working on a proposal for how we might accelerate some of that uh, capital spend, but that's going to be a different conversation. And you're absolutely right that. That uh, impacts every single um, school board. We, we're seeing the pressures in particular in the big metros as well as the outlying areas, which is why I think the minister is prioritizing that. But there's, there's more to come for all of the school boards. Did you want to comment on that? 
Yeah, thank you, Premier. Just as a quick supplement, um, the 1% increase to the base grants are for all school boards, so that includes metro and rural schools as well. So they will also see a 1% increase to their base rates. So uh, that applies to everyone. In addition, there's also that 1% increase, as we mentioned, it's across the board for, for all of our different grants. That includes specifically the, ru the rural small schools grant. That's also being increased by 1%, which of course specifically targets um, small rural schools. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. In addition, in the last budget cycle, uh, we were able to move ahead uh, a number of full construction projects outside of our metro regions, uh, specifically a new K-5 school in Black Falls, um, a new school in uh, Fort McMurray, a francophone school in Fort McMurray, uh, a replacement school in Medicine Hat, a new school in Nanton, a new school in Red Earth Creek. Uh, so we're def definitely committed, but of course we have a, a lot of um, challenges. We do absolutely have aging infrastructure primarily in some of our, our smaller and older communities. And we also have historic growth affecting primarily our, our metropolitan uh, our, uh, metropolitan regions and zones. So we do want to make sure we do recognize both of those challenges and we do want to try our best to address both of them indeed. So you've ripped the Band-Aid off, so I'm going to ask the follow-up question because I see Minister McIver here as well, Minister of Municipal Affairs. Is there going to be an injection into municipalities as well? Because they're struggling as well with infrastructure deficits while the schools are being struggled with. Infrastructure funding needs to be upgraded as well because if you talk to Tyler Gandum, Paul McLaughlin, they'll both say yeah. the same thing. I apologize for getting Minister Kyver over here, but they need to go hand in hand, do they not? Yeah, well, I, I, you know, obviously we can't speak to, to future budget uh, considerations or decisions, um, but uh, since Minister McIver is here as well, uh, perfectly timed, I'll, I'll let him address that for you. Thank you. Good. Well, thank you for the question. Um, as uh, municipalities are aware that uh, something they've long advocated for is to have their uh, annual capital funding from the province go up or down with the provincial revenue. And as of April 1st this year, that the answer from our government is yes. So uh, now, some years it'll go down, but this next year coming up, it'll be a 14% increase. And I think the year after that, it'll be two or 3% decrease. I think that final number will be determined by our final accounting of the province's, uh, you know, uh, finances from last year. In addition, uh, this year we added uh, $60 million over three years, $20 million a year, to uh, deal with growth pressures, uh, both sustain, both two things, to deal with sustainability of municipalities that for whatever reason are just having a tough time making it now, but also to deal with those ones that are successful in attracting growth, because sometimes when you attract growth in municipality, it comes with expenses, like expanding perhaps the water treatment or wastewater treatment or maybe improves improvements to roads or intersections, or the whole number of things in municipalities that do that could be affected when you bring in a new business or successfully bring in some new economic development. So we are making steps that way and uh, that that's this year's budget and uh, as, as the Minister Nicolaides correctly said, you're going to have to wait for next year's budget. But you just signed the $256 million. Yeah, in, indeed. Defense. Indeed. We ex just did, did extend uh, a program that has been going on for about 15 years with the federal government. It started out as it called the uh, gas tax. And through a couple of iterations, it's now the Canada Community Building Fund, um, which we successfully negotiated an update with the federal government. And we're grateful with them for that. But, but after we, we had to talked them into some amendments. It was always a very flexible uh, fund for municipalities where they could basically spend it on whatever uh, capital infrastructure needs that they happen to have, almost without limit. And then the federal government this year changed it and added a whole bunch of very restrictive conditions. So we didn't sign off on it right away and we went to work on behalf of municipalities to uh, A, make sure they got that money, but B, make sure they got it under more favorable circumstances. And I would say we were successful in, uh, in uh, talking to our federal counterparts and, and having them uh, realize, and we're grateful they did realize, that Alberta municipalities need more or the similar flexibility to what they had before. It's not exactly the same, but we got it in the neighborhood of where it has been. So feel very happy that we were able to successfully uh, negotiate an extension for, uh, uh, gosh, 10 or 15 years. I, 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 if you need that 
clarification, I'll get it for you. But it's a it's, it's a multi year, uh, two hundred and sixty five million dollar funding program for Alberta municipalities, which will flow through the province. And for those municipalities watching, yes, we will get the paperwork done as quick as we can and flow it as quick as we can. But our federal partners who are providing the money require some reporting, so we will have to do that reporting, and we'll get all that in place and get the money out the door just as quick as we can. Thank you for the cameo, Minister and, McIver. And I'll just add to that as well. I mean, it's it. Uh, it may have an impact as well on students because many of them use public transit. But at the Council of the Federation last week, when we were talking about the federal government needing to step up with a new infrastructure program, they've come up with a $30 billion transit program. And we are going to do everything we can to make sure Alberta gets its per capita share. Right now it's being uh, proposed as an application-based program. But we have got plans to take the uh, blue line to the airport, figure out a similar solution in Edmonton, um, develop commuter rail, between some of our major cities like Airdrie and Okotoks and um, uh, potentially uh, start figuring out a way to integrate all of this for a, a broader base commuter rail program. We also, um, they have a special rural stream, so we'll be wanting to talk with uh, rural Alberta about the way in which we can perhaps develop some kind of uh, public transit solution that maybe it makes more sense for people coming into the big city if they need doctor's appointments and that sort of thing. But there is a special rural route for that as well. And that, that may be able to assist us in managing some of the transportation pressures as well. So we're we're very keen to work with the feds on trying to find a way to, to caution that. Because what, what they normally do is they would put money forward, we would put money forward, and then the party that we're partnering with would put money forward. So that could uh, potentially be $10 billion over the, the next 10 years if we're successful. And we have time for a couple more questions. We're going to head over to the phones, though. Operator, could you put through our first caller, please? No callers. <laughs> Operator, can we put... I think your first question comes from Jonathan Bradley with Western Standard. Please go ahead. Hello, Premier Smith. Thank you for taking my question. So you spoke about $215 million being allocated towards the fund to hire more teachers and educational assistants and that it will be, all school boards will be eligible for it. How will this funding be divided? Um, it is going to be split between the operational funding and the modulars, and I think the minister has the breakdown on how that would work. I think it's $115 million for the operational funding and $100 million for the modulars. No, I mean... Uh, I mean, for uh, like the school, like which school boards will be getting it? Right. Like, how that decided? I just wanted to make sure that we were just using the the uh, the right number. So it's 125 million, which is the stabilizing money. The balance of that is the the modulars. I think you've got a pretty good idea of where the modulars are going. Do you have some idea of how you're going to to divvy up the 125 million? Yeah, thank you. Uh, with respect to the modulars, uh, the uh, the addition of the 100 modulars will be for our uh, metro school divisions. Um, the 125 million that is going to increase operating funding is going to all school authorities. So they will see a 1% increase in uh, all of their base rates. And all school authorities will see a 2% increase in some of the uh, specialized uh, learner support grants that I mentioned, including uh, supports for English as an additional language, uh, puff supports, and other areas. Okay, and my follow-up pertains to the modular classrooms. So you spoke about these classrooms uh, intending to enhance education. How do you believe that modular classrooms will make uh, the educational experience for students more enjoyable? Sure. Well, the short answer is, uh, of course, the, the, the modular classrooms. And, and I, don't, I never really like calling them modular classrooms. I, I prefer to call them uh, prefabricated classrooms. If, if you haven't seen them, I mean, when I think of a modular classroom, I think of a trailer. These, the, these aren't. I mean, I got to tour the facility where they make them, and uh, they are quite exceptional. Uh, so I would really characterize them as prefab classrooms. Um, the way in which they're going to help enhance student learning is simply by helping to alleviate uh, uh, space uh, needs and pressure. Uh, of course, there are many schools, uh, as our colleagues from Calgary Board of Education noted, that uh, are at very high utilization rates. So if we can deploy additional modulars, it means that uh, we can have less students, reduce class sizes in particular areas, and, and uh, of course, uh, provide uh, more direct supports to students who need it. Thanks. Thank you, Jonathan. And we have time for one last question here. Operator, could you put through our next caller, please? 
Your next question comes from the line of Elisa Carpenter with Global News. Please go ahead. Hi there. Uh, I just wanted to ask about the education money. We've been pretty specific on the number of modulars and, um, you know, how those will be divvied up. But uh, there's been mentioned a couple of times that this will allow for more teachers and educational assistants. So do we have a number on how many more teachers this will allow us uh, to hire? And the follow-up to that would be, will they be in place by this September or are we looking at next school year? Well, I'd say a couple of things. Part of the reason we can't be precise is if a school board chooses to use 100% of the dollars for teachers, that'll be one number. If they choose to use 100% of the dollars for education assistance, that'll be another number. I can uh, have Demetrios comment on that, but then maybe Marilyn, you might have some insight into how what the split is likely to be and what, where the pressures are. But our, in, our intention in announcing it today was that we'd been, of course, reading that um, uh, school boards are, are making the staffing decisions now, and we wanted to make sure that they had the certainty of having these dollars so that they could offer their contracts. First, um, Mr. Nicolaitis. Uh, yeah, thank you, Premier. Um, I think just to reiterate the Premier's point, I think the Premier noted it quite well. Um, in the past, sometimes we have provided targeted funding specifically for the purposes of hiring teachers or hiring educational assistants. Today's funding announcement is a broad increase to the general base rates. And so the school boards have the complete autonomy and discretion to determine how they want to allocate those funds. I, I'm, you know, I, uh, I'll let the um, I'll let Marilyn Dennis and, and others speak to their operations, but of course a significant component of their operating costs deals with staff. Um, so they may be looking uh, to hire additional educational assistants or teachers, or they may be uh, looking to increase funding to a particular program, uh, increasing funding to dual credit opportunities, for example, if that's something that's of particular importance to a, a particular community. So that they have the complete discretion to determine how those funds are allocated. But perhaps uh, Marilyn, who's in a better position, can tell us a little bit more about uh, funding decisions at a school board level. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it, it is a great question. I think it's uh, very difficult to be precise. Um, as the Premier mentioned, individual school boards um, have the autonomy to make the decisions necessary for the students that they serve within their division. And so our school board trustees will work closely with school administration to help determine how those resources should de be deployed um, to best serve the students that they have in front of them coming this fall. Um, the um, Part of the strength of this announcement, frankly, is that this money is coming before the school year starts. And so already school divisions would have been working on their hiring processes in the springtime of the end of this last school year. And so they would already have a really good idea on where some of their pressure points would be. Uh, but again, trustees will work alongside their administration in terms of how to deploy those dollars. Thank you. Alyssa, did you have a follow-up? Uh, I'm good. Thank you very much. Good. Perfect. And that's all the time we have for questions today. Thank you, everyone, Thanks, for everyone. joining us. <laughs>